This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl episode. Can't believe it. Number 80. Wow. Good morning, Timothy Seymour Dahl. Waking up, having a little uh, caffeine. Mm. After my hangover of television of yesterday's inauguration, the inauguration, the, the exiting, it started in the morning with the exiting of Donald Trump with uh, with uh, my way by Sinatra as, as Air Force One was flying into uh, f- out, out of D.C. into Florida. And when uh, but excuse and- me, Tim, excuse me, yes. when he's walking away, they were playing <laughs> YMCA, a oh, place it, he's never been in his life, a place he's never been in his life. And even better, actually, a lot of the parade marching bands, one of them was sur- circling the White House the day before um, playing Hit the Road Jack uh, mm-hmm. nonstop <laughs> around the fucking White House. But did you see Melania's facial expression when they arrived in Florida? Because usually they wave and they smile. She just gunned it to the limo or whatever, the, the, their little secure uh, SUV. She looked pissed. I, I think he was being abusive on the whole flight down. I mean, it, <laughs> well, he was. She just- looked- Supposedly, he was watching the inauguration the whole way down. Really? That's the report. So I guess she was pissed that Lady Gaga and J-Lo weren't at their farewell fuck off event. Well, well, that's the thing. That, that's the thing. And, and I, I, I wanted to talk about this later. These are all these people that Trump wanted to like him. The shit list of pop musicians that played <laughs> uh, all night for Biden and he just desperately wants to be liked by people like that. And they all hate his guts. This was the irony to me. As everyone is celebrating as this fraudulent president is exiting, they bring in all night music of fraudulent music. (laughs) It's like the whole thing just, it just, I hate to sound, be so cynical, but it's just like, yay, he's gone, but we're making the world better and, and everything's gonna be resolved through Justin Timberlake, Bon Jovi, Foo Fighters. You have a larger stomach for bad uh, no, media. No, 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 no. I, I like some bad music. The list, maybe with the, I give the boss some passes, but the, everyone else is just these Vegas, you know, automaton performers. They're not even artists. They have no voice. Katy Perry and, you know, Biden dancing to Demi Lovato. It, it was just, it's, it's, it's like it's like America's so great. Now we're going to show how incredible, incredibly diverse and, and, and talented we are through presenting the McDonald's and Burger King of music. OK, like, all right. Lord. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop you right there, because, as I said, you have a larger stomach for McDonald's and Burger King type music than I do. <laughs> what I have to give some cred to is the young poet laureate during the morning session who read that poem gorman 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 oh and that was incredible and you know winning a poetry award when she's like 17 and as an activist she was stunning i mean she was the best part and i will say can these I, can i challenge you on this because i saw some, saw some interviews with her she's obviously brilliant you know, she went to harvard and all that stuff i don't, i just have a hard time and of course you already had a made a legendary band when you were still very young so i don't want to be too hard on young people but how much wisdom does a 22 year old have? I, I, I don't, I just, it's, it's kind of sat, didn't sit well with me. It's Excuse like, me, Tim. It depends on who that 22 year old <laughs> All is. All right, fine, fine, fine. Come on, give me a break here. I mean, I mean she, she's brilliant, but I, just, well, I actually wasn't as impressed as everyone else was, but maybe I was being cynical. I don't know. Well, yeah, you're cynical. So <laughs> what does it matter? We'll see how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Anyway, I, okay. b- 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 back to the, back to the initial inauguration half hour because I didn't get to watch the evening section because I just couldn't be fucked to do it or I was too busy getting fucked to do it. (laughs) Uh, Let's just say this. I was pretty impressed. And these songs are also horrible. Of course, I might have preferred the original Roseanne Barr version. But when Lady Gaga uh, sang whichever horrible American anthem she did, I have to say she she did it with quite a bit of incredible dignity. Well, I, I was I, very I, impressed with her with her presence, I have to say. I had I had a similar reaction. So, so Lady Gaga, you know, her style, I never liked it. So it's like Liza Minnelli, like, Wah! you know, I, I'm not into that shit. 
but she can hear pitch. Uh, I mean, I, she can actually hear that, you know, a lot of pop stars can't even hear the music they're trying to say. So she can hear it and she can hit the marks. She did it very straight. I was like, how is she going to do it? But I feel like she kind of slipped on a banana peel because she had these little melismatic ornaments she threw in just a few of them, like sort of like um, when a actor in some kind of comedy is playing the, the straight character and it's funny because they stay play it so straight. But and then they do a little wink and it kind of blows it a little bit. She had a few ornaments that kind of kind of blew it for me a little bit. It doesn't matter. You know what? She's had enough press. We don't really need to talk about her. We don't need to Let's talk about the fact that today the air feels different. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, it, it does. And, there is a collective sigh of relief for now. Well, I mean, the amount of executive orders, I think it's a, a record on, on, within 24 hours. I think it was like, what, 17 or something? I mean, we're, we've joined uh, who again? We've joined the Paris Climate uh, thing Accord. again. Accord. Um, we, we, we halted the uh, production of, of the, well, the Keystone contracts, which is kind of strange because it was Obama and Biden that gave him the contracts to begin with. But, but still, we halted that. We stopped the uh, erection of that pathetic little wall. I don't know. There's a, there's a bunch of shit. So, you know, I don't, when I say I'm cynical, I still want to be optimistic. I still want to be hopeful. Um, I just, I just don't like it. Those kind of NPR kind of things of like, we're so sophisticated. We're so cultured. And now you're going to hear Justin Timberlake and Bon Jovi. It was like when PBS was doing fundraisers, like, isn't it, aren't you so glad there's media that doesn't insult your intelligence? And if you donate now, we'll give you river dance at Red Rocks. And it's like, oh. <laughs> well, and the Republicans, once again, are probably going to do their best to see to that. Although it was very interesting to see uh, Moscow Mitch, cocaine Mitch McConnell, uh, <laughs> kind of have a change of face. But there's so many new dumb Republicans in there that want to block everything. And you know, to me, it's still basically all one and a half parties. I think there are a few more people in the Democratic Party that actually might have souls or conscience uh, and consciousness. But still, they're all basically corporate shills. And other than Bernie Saunders and his fabulous homemade mittens sitting Mitten. by himself. Re reused, reused grandma sweaters and whipped <laughs> plastic for a, a, a for a lining of fleece. But one thing that kept on bumming me out, and I, I know what the strategy was with the Democrats, like we want to reach across the aisle, we want to show unity. They kept on giving nods to Ronald Reagan. Uh, and I, and, I, and uh, I, was just, I, was just, I was like, well, you know, there is no Trump without Ronald Reagan. It, it, it's like, it kind of, I, I feel like, do you not get that? I, well, I, what, what was amazing to me is that those two-faced, flip-flopping, fraudulent fuckheads like Lindsey Graham, attended the inauguration. What fucking nerve this dude has. What <laughs> well, fucking nerve. So, well, even worse, so did Ted Cruz, whose uh, speech basically lost. Oh yeah, he was there. He was just a total sociopath, just acting like, here I am, I'm doing this, I'm doing the ritual, you know. <laughs> it makes no sense. The United States voting situation has always been fucked up. It's always been, there's always been a great amount of fraud or mistrust or redistricting or these machines don't work. Now, but considering that there's been a lot of attention for this and considering that even when Trump won, he said it was rigged, which, you know, he can believe that because that was ridiculous. But again, a lot of countries still have paper ballots, which are harder to fraud. Uh, machines can break down. They can be fucking hacked. I'm sure there was more surveillance on these than ever before. But what is wrong? You know, get everybody in the town hall, raise their hands. Yay or nay? Do a well, head count. I'm, well, <laughs> the, Bohr, the, the Gore Bush hanging Chad was kind of a paper one that kind of failed. It's hard. It's it, I mean, 300 fucking million. I don't actually not that not that many people. Even 150 that. million people. It yeah. doesn't matter. But the thing is, if you lose 60 fucking lawsuits, that that are overturned by people you put in positions of power. Hello, Hatriots and Magabillies. Wise the fuck up and jump off, Trump. Get the hell out. So I want to talk about the absolute unraveling collapse of QAnon in the last 24 hours and the internal war amongst those people. It, it is so insane. And, and some of them are just like, 
wait, I've been had. Other people are like, don't. We've dare. been cocked. Yeah, you, you've been cocked. Or don't. And then the other one's like, you have to stay on board to this or you're done. And then, and then of course, the latest one is, Biden was Q all along. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I, <laughs> I'm going to recommend an article that Weasel sent to me that really kind of breaks down the whole Q phenomena. And it was written by uh, somebody who designs virtual reality games and it's on medium.com and the the article is uh called game designers analysis of QAnon okay so I really recommend people read that on medium.com it really breaks down and illustrates exactly how people get suckered in to false mysteries put the pieces together and then think that's the solution because they've come to a fraudulent conclusion it's a really good analysis. I highly recommend it. Medium.com. I've seen this with a few people, maybe sometimes when they suffer mental illness, this kind of Nostradamus thing. People, it's really weird when people double down on a specific time and date where it's all going down. So they're all saying at noon yesterday, <laughs> that's, that's when Trump is going to take over America again. And, 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 they're all, and then it didn't happen, right? It, or it's sort of like, it's sort of like Raelians or, you know, whatever cult that they believe this event's going to happen and then it doesn't happen. And it's always like, what happens afterwards? They, they just kind of <laughs> just like, uh, I, I'm, I'm in denial of what I believed up until a second ago. Or, or I, I did love the headline. <laughs> We've been cocked. <laughs> We've been cocked. My, I, I'm a laughing stock. To, I'm a laughing stock to the rest of my family. Well, the thing is, all of these conspiracies are all simply recycled anyway. And again, I do believe that a quarter of a part of any conspiracy is true, but they always, they always just go so far off the fucking mark. Yes, there's sex trafficking wing, uh, uh, rings that sex traffic in women and children. This has gone for, on forever. I doubt if Hillary Clinton is in charge of it. Okay. Pizzagate, I don't, there's no basement. You went to the wrong fucking place, you idiots. So I think, and yes, there is a, a cabal of rich, <laughs> elite, devious motherfuckers, but they give, they give these cabals too much credit. They just give them too much credit. And, and it's just ridiculous. In the end, it's just absolutely based on fear of other. So, so Trump did not preemptively pardon his family or himself, but he did preemptively pardon Bannon yesterday. Well, and, you can't, uh, well, first of all, you can't preemptively, Bannon was charged with a crime. If you haven't been charged yet, you can't just, you know, right. fully pardon without, without the crime being first leveled against you. Well, and the big thing about Bannon is how much money he took for the so-called wall. And in the end, what do we get? A wall oh, yeah. around the Capitol. Ha ha ha. 430 miles of wall reparation. And then people are already scaling and it's already collapsing. And just, just if, I mean, look, Hitler wanted to build a 3000 wall mile wall around Europe as well. Give me a fucking break. Shoot higher. Well, you, you know, you know, a lot of the people he, he pardoned yesterday besides like certain uh, mercenary criminals <laughs> murders, but a lot of them were just, uh, fraud just just contractor well, uh again, bank bank dudes. bank fraud, bank money frauds and the thing is why didn't he pardon any of the of his uh little followers who broke into the capital because oh, he doesn't give a shit about you you no, fucking yeah. idiots no they're freaking about that he again classism no they didn't have enough money for him to pardon them but he pardoned little wayne and i and I was little here, wayne has a lot of money as i'm saying it was a giuliani $2 million tab if you the pay to play. I, I or Kim Kardashian gave really a blow job. Did something because she's hey, I wonder, really I, I wonder how her law career is coming. Oh, yeah. Well, her father kind of was, I guess. But uh, um, well, look, you saw the look on his face when they said not guilty. He died there on the spot, Robert Kardashian. His face dropped. It also went in, it almost went into the hang dog look, which I love, which. Michael Cohen's spots <laughs> on a daily <laughs> basis. Droopy, droopy, droopy. I, <laughs> droopy dog. Well, well, so on social media, I was mentioning yesterday, I was really bummed out that Garth Brooks didn't come out in the form of Chris Gaines, which, uh, which would have been, do you know about Chris Gaines? Uh, I wish he would. Yes, I do. I wish, <laughs> I wish he would have come out as Chris Rock. Well, that would, that would have been very controversial. So, you know, it's so funny when I, so the, a classmate of mine at UMass Amherst in the music department, like small classes, like eight people, very talented clarinetist, is now the Colonel marching band music. Uh, he's like a military guy, 
conductor for the presidents. He does all the suits and marches. He's done it since Trump. Now he's going to do it with Biden. Like, and I, I just think about like military or Pentagon. You can do, I always forget, you can do any profession. You can be a movie director in through via the military. And I was just watching some of these military bands yesterday. And isn't that would be funny as fuck that your profession is a military sousaphone player? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's just that's kind of you have all these like you know, the top level sousaphone player. You have this giant thing that you have to get up in the morning, you have all these medals on you, and like boom, 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 boom. Anyhow, I was kind of getting well. I, I always felt like with my own one woman army, I was like a female militia spoken word artist, but that's just me, myself, and I. I guess that's three of us. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I don't know. Pelosi, Pelosi today, she was like, no, being president of the United States doesn't allow you to be like, oh, get out of jail for free card because I'm at the end of my term. And she's still going to, she said she's going to talk with Biden about what's, what, you know, it's going to fit with his agenda, but she's still. Well, okay. The fear, the, the, yeah. The fear of this is, the fear is this Biden. The forgiver. You know what? Kamala, I bet, isn't so forgiving, which is who I'm counting on, because if she hosts the impeachment awards, can't wait for that one. That'd be funny. I, I Again, not to go cynical, they kept on bringing that fucking dude from that musical Hamilton on there really? yesterday. And it just every time I see that guy, my blood boils. I, he's, he's so impressed with himself. And I think it's like, just like I think, you know, when you turn on cable TV, the weather channel, and you hear jet Fusak, like smooth jazz, I'm like, you know, how do we go from Miles Davis to this? It's like the trajectory of rap goes to Hamilton. It just, it just makes me want to barf. But anyhow, but I'll say one last thing. I think 90% of those performers yesterday were also halftime Super Bowl performers. So it really felt like the halftime Super Bowl performance. I, I really think like John, Le uh, Justin Timberlake, Bon Jovi, Foo Fighters, Katy Perry, Bruce Springsteen, they're all, they're, it all felt like a, a football match. But, but that's, what, that's what Howard Stern said. He goes, this guy used to be a guest on my show all the time. All he wants to be is liked by celebrities and models. And yet he just picked a profession and an attitude to basically alienate, alienate himself from all these people. They all hate his guts. They want, they, they, Look, it started with his father. His father hated his guts and everybody else has carried on in the tradition of hating his fucking guts. All right, let's get on with the show here. Some a group that's always kind of rallied against the status quo and have been digging into the way that people are brainwashed through media or using various forms of uh, sound manipulation to make their point heard always from a very outsider status, including being sued by you two, uh, is Negative <laughs> Land. And I'm very happy to have Mark of Negative Land here on the Lydian Spin episode number 80. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and a special guest, especially considering you're sitting in the wilds of North Carolina, Mark from Negative Land. Hi, Mark. Hello. How do you do? Good to see everybody. Good to or see hear you. everybody. Good to, <laughs> be, good to be me, I must say. I was very impressed with your description of where you're sitting right now. Can you, can you kind of review that for me? You were saying wolves howling. What, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of a curious thing as you know, as you get older and you keep doing the weird shit that you do and you're trying to figure out how to make it work both financially and also for your own sanity. And, uh, and it kind of turns out that uh, even though I think a good deal of the audience for what we do is in, you know, is in big cities and urban places, places I have dear friends and love to visit, that I'm good at visiting them, but not living in them 24 seven. And so I've been living for quite a while up a uh, dirt road in Western North Carolina in the Appalachian uh, Mountains and um, surrounded by, uh, on one side of me, there's 700 acres with a herd of a uh, hundred buffalo on them. That's one neighbor. Whoa. And, uh, then the other, another neighbor is, they've got 90 acres and it's an exotic animal rescue ranch thing. And, and it's, they, they get a hold of, of 
of uh, pets that people have gotten, uh, ended up with very stupidly, you know, with wolves or a sloth or kangaroos or, and that's what's kind of across the way for me. So uh, they recently ended up with a bunch of wolves and I was sitting on my front porch and, and nowadays basically every night for the last, I don't know, nine months, I get to hear wolves howling every couple of hours. It's that's cool. Fun. Yeah, it's it, great. I love it. I, I'm kind of waiting for a pet rescue or an exotic animal place to come and rescue me, actually. You, you know, it's, it's funny. My dad was uh, dating a woman. He was living in Chicago, and she lived right in Lincoln Park, right on the Lincoln Park Zoo. And her balcony, we'd hear at night, the wolves, because you were right to the zoo, they were doing their little nightly howling so yeah i i super like it so are these people kind of like that what's that woman carol baskin from uh are they, are they kind of like this or they, i guess that's a whole demographic of rescue exotic animal people there's yeah, exotic animal I, just, and there's, I, I just love that i i've i've ended up living somewhere that has things happen around me that are so strange i mean they would never they'd never happen in a million years anywhere else than where i am so i, I do appreciate that and and though I may not always agree with people who live here, if I talk to them about religion or politics, as I think Lydia probably knows, there's a, there's a very strong kind of DIY culture that's in these mountains that I really do connect to. And I love the Carolinas. And as, yeah, I, I wasn't, it's not the same, but spending some time in Louisville and in Kentucky, I mean, I love the South, first of all. I mean, North Carolina, Kentucky, eh, South, are they really? Uh, where does the border begin? But Do the bison, or you said buffalo herders, do they get along with the, uh, I mean, is there, is there any like Hatfield and McCoys going on in between the uh, oh, I, ex exotic well, yeah. animal well, I collectors? Think, <laughs> I, I, do th I do think the exotic animal rescue people are very to the left, and then the, the buffalo guy is... Ah. Um, is Trump oh. since 2020 sign out in front of his house. No, it's, it, you know, but, but you, you, you know, you, you get well, along with people. I, can, I, mean, I, can, I get along with a yeah, lot yeah, of people. Yeah, of course, of course. You, you got to yeah. function. And, and, and the, uh, I, I, excuse me, take a, I have to fix my sound. Simon seems to think it's very echoey. I've just changed yeah. the game, Simon. Is it, the, is, is it the computer sound that you have or is it the no, yeah, uh, we interface? Check, yeah, we got to check the just, preferences. Just quiet down for a minute there, Timothy <laughs> Dahl. Um, <laughs> Oh, hang on. I see what's going on. Calm down. All right. Let me turn the gain up. And both stop talking at the same time, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, that's no fun. Tough shit. Who said this <laughs> is supposed to be fucking fun? I already sorted, sorted the issue out. Could be a little louder? That's the first time anybody said that to me. That's too loud. Sure, sure. <laughs> no, suck a dick. Uh, back to the bison for a minute. Or, or not exactly, but uh, I'm, I'm in Brooklyn. Back to the bison. I'm in Brooklyn. But about two months ago, there was a report, and usually this is only in the Bronx, of a tiger in somebody's apartment. Now, to me, that's just a bit outlandish. I mean, a tiger in a New York apartment, not, not a, a Brooklyn apartment. What the hell's going on? I didn't call Joe Exotica because, you know, he's in the right place, if you ask me. That's all I'm saying. I mean, isn't the bigger debate is that you guys are more kind of ketchup based barbecue as opposed to vinegar based down in the uh in the low country is is that a a huge north carolina debate how long have you been there basically i mean how, how yeah, much? i know i know what you're talking about and i have a hard time with the with the the barbecue uh, sauce flavors out here yeah because i i think i'm more of an old school you know i'm more of the sticky Ah, okay. Brown okay. by the way tim is an excellent grill master and he does know his meat Yes, but grill master is different than barbecue. I mean, that's well, a whole, that's a whole other. That's a different. Excuse debate. me. The last time you had a fucking barbecue, you invited Simon. You didn't invite me. I have no idea about that, Tim. I'm just saying. I... I've tasted your. I've tasted your meat, and it's delicious. So, so how long have you been in North Carolina? Uh, since uh, 2005, actually. Yeah, a while. And, and what brought you there? Oh well, actually, it, I I fell in love with someone here, and 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 I get to moved across the country to give it a try, and uh, that lasted for about a year. And but I I uh, was was it good for that year though? It was it was, and actually nothing it was, wrong it, with that. It actually taught me. It was the first time I had a relationship end where it didn't feel like I was having my guts ripped out through my nose. And so I actually feel like I, I learned a lot of good things from it. And also learned that this area 
though when I look at on a map where I am, it still to this day kind of freaks me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the beauty, the people, the culture, the pace of things, and that I could, it was actually aff affordable for me to, you know, make the crappy money I make and actually get a little house. So it, it, it all seemed like, okay, I think this actually, this actually kind of works. Let's see I want to jump in and talk about love for one second, which is not a topic I often discuss on this show, but here we go. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Of course. <laughs> you know, the problem with most relationships is people put too much expectation on the other person. First of all, you have to know how to satisfy yourself. You have to really know what you want and you can't expect somebody else to give it to you. Right. And also they put, they, they think that, Nobody is forever. There's dozens possibly of uh, soulmates. And I've always thought, you know what? This is great now and let's keep it great and keep it and take it in on a cellular level. And remember that these feelings that you have, which are so fantastic, they're your feelings. I'm just the vehicle for it. Come on, baby, drive my car. As I like to say, <laughs> drive, 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 drive back to reality. I think that's good. Yeah, I, I do. I do think that it's it's important to remember that. Yeah, when you're in any kind of relationship you're in, that it's 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 somehow a vehicle for the things that you're experiencing. And yeah. that includes in a relationship with band members. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I I very much mean that when I'm saying I'm thinking of that as I'm saying this and if and nodding my head. Uh, yeah, because I'm thinking about the the. Ne negative land is an extremely uh, non-hierarchical collaborative endeavor. And so, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated creature. And it's amazing to me that it's, it's persisted for this long. But because it has persisted for decades. Yeah, 40 I mean, years. Ama amazing. So how often do you guys take it on the road? Because that's usually when it really stress tests a band is when you're rubbing elbows 24 seven for yeah. a month at a time. We've never toured a lot. We've never been, it's not a lifestyle I want to live. I prone to anxiety attacks. Okay. And, uh, so in a way going on stage is sort of the worst thing possible for me to do. Oh. But there's something I'm really drawn to about taking kind of the 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 wonky cerebral brainy weirdness of what we make and taking it out there and doing it in front of people not just doing this thing in, in the studio or in our you know in our in our offices or bedrooms and there's something very compelling about about actually going out there and ha and having this thing that we do happen in a room with other people uh which is part of why i haven't been super excited about doing all these kind of online live performance things during the uh, era of COVID because it, you, you know, it's, you're not in the, it's being in the room with people. That is what makes it really yeah. interesting. Some of my best performances, trust me, Mark, are in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not talking about music, honey. More um, so than the bedroom or the kitchen. Tim doll. The living room. <laughs> Let's keep it. Wait, you know what? I was a nomad for many years. I had to, I had a lot of great performances in other people's living rooms. So I was just keep, <laughs> keep it at that, okay? So, so you're originally from California? More or less. I mean, I yeah, I was actually I was uh, born in where was I was born in Billings, Montana, and I had a dad who worked for this insurance company and moved around a bunch. And when we finally ended up back in the Bay Area, which is where he and my mom had met and where all the family was. My mom kind of put her foot down and said, we're, we're, not, you're not, we're not moving anymore. We're going to stay here. There's relatives. We have some family. You know, we can raise our kids in a way that's a little more sane. And also, what a great place, you know, when you're a, a teenager or a little later to find like-minded weirdos yes. to start creating with. Because it was a very ripe time, both in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, then, when you started performing, when I started performing. Yeah, and Let's talk a little bit about that. So you're in San Francisco, thank God, out of Billings, Montana. And when did you start getting into music, both you know, as a listener and then decide, okay, I got to do this and I got to do something absolutely different than everybody else? Well, we were, well, I was in the suburbs. So San Francisco would be a place I would visit. There was this brand new train called B Bart, Bart and there was transportation. And suddenly, I mean, you don't realize this when you're a kid that the incredible opportunity and in a way a privilege I had that I was so close to all this cultural weirdness and it just happened I came of age as punk was happening and post-punk and just this kind of explosion of reaction of, of ideas and reaction against mainstream culture and thinking and everything and it was uh 
it was it was very exciting and very compelling. And I and I, you know, I can remember I actually had in my high school art class in 1979. I was playing the first Suicide album, <laughs> and I was playing Teenage Jesus and the Jerks mm-hmm. tracks from the No New York album. And I was having other kids threaten to like literally threaten to kill me. If I didn't take the music off. Well, you know, it's called suicide, not homicide. And it's called teenage Jesus, which means you're a fucking jerk. I mean, I I wish kids. I wish kids were threatened to kill each other these days over music. It doesn't seem like. You know know what? Hang on. Hang on. They threaten to kill each other over the way they look at some or the way that somebody looks. They don't need even the excuse. I know. Artistic aesthetic. I know. Well, I wonder if. I I don't want it to this. Yeah, I don't want to sound. Old, old in this particular case, but I don't know if, if music can even f- scare people anymore the way I re- it really did used to scare. Uh, it's got a lot of you know music before not just uh, written language before spoken language. It scared people. Th- it's it's got a long way to go. It's just that's just a little pop culture yeah moment, but it, 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 it'll, it'll scare people again. But right? I but I wanted to say that, and I'm and I'm really glad that Lydia asked this question because. What really inspired me about punk was not so much the music, the haircuts, the, the uh, you know, jackets. I mean, it was, it was the ethos, the ethic, the spirit of it, of just of pushing against things, of, of breaking rules or creating as if there were no rules and that you were going to keep going with that. And I really feel like back then, and I really want to hear what you have to say about this, it really felt to me like that spirit and ethic and ethos was equally a part of what it was as well as the music. And so when I heard No New York, that album to me, I was like, yes, that's what this is supposed to be doing is just keep going and keep getting more and more completely insane. And I, so I absolutely loved, I loved well, it. I, and you, you hit it because the difference between No Wave and Punk is that Punk was for the most part, more of a political statement and rightfully so. And No Wave was more about individual insanity, and rightfully so. <laughs> and also, it wasn't, you know, in my case, it was just a rebellion against all music as well. It was just yeah. complete rebellion. And I'm so happy that those were the records you so, played. And I'm also very happy that, you know, I was able to tour the music of Suicide with Mark Rutata, which was just a highlight of my career, singing Ellen Vega songs. Oh, well, Retrovirus has been, had been doing Frankie Teardrop for a long time. It's, the, the, the pathos, the beauty, the weirdness, the doo-wop, the synthesizers, Alan Vega and Martin Rev, it, well, nothing could be better. Yeah, it's, and, that, and Frankie Teardrop to this day still is a scary piece of music, I think. Yeah. Oh, it is. I'll it's, send you our version, trust oh, me. Great. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. That's, fant- that's fantastic. I'm not telling you you should wear a diaper, but have a tissue nearby. Because <laughs> you're in the Bay Area. I mean, we're, we're, did the residents have an uh, influence on you in terms of... Well, what? I think that it, it's... It's that, yeah, I mean, in fact, I've just been asked to write something for some book about the residents and because I do have a story of being, I think, uh, would I have been 16 years old and, wa- and in a record store and hearing Duck Stab for the first time and just feeling like someone had stuck some electrical plug into my brain and was piping something in from another, literally from another planet. This wasn't even from Earth. And I didn't understand how it could sound like, I mean, nothing about it made any sense in the way that was beautiful and so, so exciting and energizing. So encountering all these things, and you know, I can think of the, seeing the film Eraserhead was, a, was important to me. It wasn't that I wanted to do any of that. It was that you were just hearing people who were doing, just pursuing their own thing in this pure, kind of intense way and just just doing what their vision was and they were getting it out there maybe not to a huge audience but it existed and there I was just some kid and you found it, it. And, and, it and, and it and it's good that when I mean look it doesn't matter matter whether it's out jazz literature weird uh, art whatever format opens a pathway in the individual that says I want to go beyond or there or sideways from or in that direction too and fortunately for some of us, that was the weirdest shit possible. Because let's face it, negative land, pretty fucking weird, my friend. And that is a high compliment. 
Thank well, you. I, you know, I didn't find, you know, a drummer I play with is from the Bay Area, and I didn't really know about you guys, uh, you know, obviously, because he wanted to make one of our records called Thriller, and then he brought up yeah. Negative Land and the whole U2 thing, and, uh, and I want to go into that in a second, but did finding these bands actually make you look backwards to the original found sound people, the, the original uh, experimental composers like Stockhausen, Verez. Did, did you actually go down that uh, wormhole by years later? Because it, you know, it was hard to find out about this stuff. So right. There was no internet, of course. There's no internet. So How we even found out about what we found out about was pretty amazing. Yeah, it took a lot a of hunting. But yeah, a lot of hunting, which I also think made it very compelling when you finally found one of some little gem in all of the shit that really grabbed you. It really felt like a triumphant, I don't know, it, it yeah. was something about it that just sucked, really sucked me in. And, there, and I happened to be near this one record store that was getting yeah. all this stuff coming in. And I, that was sort of my channel. And, and, and that's kind of what it was down to at that point was like one record store. Because there yeah. wasn't a lot of reviews. It's, it's not like suicide was being written up or having books written about them then. It's not like I was getting, or anybody at that point was, it was those one weird record stores with the one guy that knew, or the video store as well, yeah. you mentioned Eraserhead, that really helped. And for me, it was a college radio DJ when I was 13, who I just forced myself upon and go, tell me more. You know, it, those were really very important to us, as well as like, on a more mainstream level, Midnight Special, Don Kirshner's rock concert, and other stuff like that. Yeah, I think that the, the there was, in fact, I've recently been in touch with some of the people who worked at that record store, and and cannot thank them enough because they 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 kind of figured out well, there's this there's this weird kid coming over from the suburbs, and he just he brings his paper route money every couple of months, and he just he comes here from op he's here from opening to closing. And he wants to hear everything that's happening that's right. strange, unusual, different, aberrant in any way. So I was being exposed to, you know, German electronica and-, and Which is where you got your name from. Yes, uh, no, yeah. Right? Uh, uh, no. yeah. We stole our name from the group mm -hmm. Noi. Yeah. And, yep. um, you know, hearing uh, Steve Reich and Philip Glass and, and all kinds of movie soundtrack stuff, Bernard Herrmann and, and uh, getting into cra crazy, uh, all the stuff that I think some of what inspired uh, Queen of Siam, you know, all that old, that, that old sh kind of great kitschy schlocky stuff. Absolutely. Well, as, well, as well as cartoon music, of course. Yeah. So I Fe think- Old Felix that, the Cat. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's, and actually mentioning Queen of Siam, that's, I just was, I just pulled that up to listen to again before doing this, this call with you. And I realized I, I, that record, I think, holds up really, really well. It's, one, it's wonderful. But also what I loved, for, what, what really meant a lot to me was the contrast that I knew it was the same person who had done Teenage Genius in the Dirt. He was not doing this. And it was like, what? Like, this is awesomely Well, great. I mean, thank you very much. But not only that, to me, because people have a certain idea. They heard it a long time ago, and they have an idea of what it sounds like. Yeah. Half of it is nursery rhymes. Yeah. The other half is big band. So even within, look, as a musical contrarian and a musical schizophrenic, even within that record, there's schizophrenia. Yeah. And the, you know, the honor of having Robert Quine of the Voidoids, one of the top guitar player in my mind's eye, on it was just phenomenal. But thank you very much for, for name checking that. But it, when you go back and hear it, I had to go back and hear it. I'm like, this is fucking weird because does it even make sense when you flip it over? No, it's a, it's a very strange record. And of course, I mean that in the most complimentary way possible. Thank you, of course. But Thank also, you. it was even more strange because it was the same person who had done this other thing that was so assaultive and over the top. And so that, again, was just inspiring to me to... to Thank yeah, you, Mark. As a, go as, in a every con direction, you know? as a contrarian, I even contrary myself repeatedly. So yeah. just, just accept and thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I should say to, and to go back to what Tim was bringing up was that I'm actually glad that I was very naive about all this stuff that had been done before, before because I think there's something to be said about knowing your history and knowing what you're doing in whatever medium you're working in and knowing the tools and the techniques and the, and, the, and the vocabulary. But there's also something to be said about not knowing shit about shit. And you're just kind of making this thing up, you think, out of thin air. And maybe 
paradoxically, you end up doing something that's actually somewhat new because you didn't know that everything you're trying to do had already been done. <laughs> Absolutely. And which makes me want to, you know, because you're at, talking about kids having infinite access to all information these days with the internet. Yeah. And now, you know, at least based on the music I was listening of yours and checking out, all this collaging, found sound and all this stuff. And now on the internet, all the re-editing of movies, TV shows. I mean, it's basically, there is this composite, almost anonymous expression of youth re-editing, I mean, remixing 2020, you know, like a whole nother sure. level. And- Look and at TikTok. TikTok is absolutely. remixing and recontextualizing everything from everywhere all the time. Yeah. And so are you there watching this from the sidelines going, you know what? <laughs> I can totally, I can relate to this. Or, or, did, you, or did, but did you like the kind of hierarchical, like I'm doing this as opposed to it is anonymous and everyone's equal and everyone's just doing it. It's, it's maybe has less of a um, spe specific uh, artistic uh, individualized expression. It's kind of this human composite thing. Are you, uh, what, what are your opinions on this basically? As you're seeing all of society, all the masses, youth and, doing yeah, it. Yeah, it's, 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 the, to some degree, there's an aspect to the internet where the, you know, everyone who's online is participating, creating this gigantic, insane global archive and, <laughs> and, and pulling out of it and, 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 and unfortunately ending up in all our own little isolated filter bubbers, bubbles. So we're disappearing up our own assholes in ways that are profoundly undemocratic and horrifying. But that's, that's another conversation. <laughs> but, but I think that I remember talking with Don Joyce of Negative Land uh, who is no longer with us. He, d he died a number of years ago. Um, but he, he was kind of guessing in the 90s. He says, I think that collage and kind of remix and appropriation is going to become an increasingly a mainstream thing. And then our work isn't going to seem as strange to people. One, one day what we do will not seem to be quite as weird as it is. It oh, well, so that kind of brings us to your latest release, which in some ways is an overview or an indictment of the massive overload of technology and surveillance and the infiltration really, which is everywhere. And please, more about that. We're thinking about this stuff. We're, we're human beings who are you know, being impacted by this and concerned about it. And so we end up, uh, Negative Land is not so interested in making love songs. I have nothing against them, but there's a gazillion of them out there. I do. There. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> go, yes? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I, I have something against love songs, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's plenty of good ones, mostly a lot of bad ones, and it's not something the world needs, I don't think the, the world needs any more of. And so kind of circling back to something Tim was kind of talking about earlier is that with all the music I was hearing back then, that it was so exciting and inspiring to me that there was something I wanted to hear that I couldn't find. I'd hear glimpses of it. There were hints of it. Mm. And there was this overall inspiration and encouragement to like, do your weird thing, follow your path. And so at some point when I was, you know, 17 years old and 18, I, uh, my friends and I said, well, this record we want to hear, we can't find it. We're going to make it. And that was, that's how Negative Land started. And I think to this day, that still animates, you know, what we do is like, there's something that I, should be out there. And I don't know, it's it, no one's doing it. I think I think we have to do it. Well, my, my first band, I decided I'm going to make something that nobody wants to fucking hear, <laughs> except for you and a few others. Like something that, you know, the one of the original concepts was music for factories to make people work faster so they don't have to hear this anymore. Just a primal expression of yeah. a tantrumizing young well, terrorist. That, that, that's funny because Muzak, the actual <laughs> the actual corporation, Muzak out of Dallas, I think it is, they, they would do back in the 70s, they would do all this market research about like, you know what? Northern California, you know, they're kind of kind of too laid back. So our background music is going to be a little, you know, all these like market research, a little more kind of frantic and get people like, you got to shop. So As opposed to was, New York, you're like, oh, you had to take yourself out of the franticness. But go ahead. Lydia was trying to just make a more forward thinking type of music, <laughs> yes. more, even more energetic. But didn't you think, mm -hmm. not, maybe you didn't, but it didn't you think that even if you knew that what you were doing was somehow 
it's this extreme over the top. Did you have some sense that there, you knew there were people out there like you who also would find- I did not fucking care, okay. nor do I to this day. Okay. But especially with Teenage Jesus, it was just absolutely a terrorizing <laughs> primal scream, but it had to be precise, yeah. you know, because I mean, it couldn't be sloppy. I literally, we rehearsed every day. But one of the highlights came much, much, I mean, 40 years later, when Tim Dahl, master musician of the bass and other instruments, was <laughs> consigned and literally had to have his hands taken like a monkey by Weasel Walter to do one show of the Teenage Jesus reunion. And that's like having a genius do a monkey's job. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he was great. He was great. But, you know, Tim Dalton couldn't. It's incomprehensible, that music, because I knew nothing. Still no, not. I don't. Chords, keys, no idea. It was just a primal instinct of yeah, annoyance. Well, the, guitar playing is, the guitar playing is great. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I only like that when metal boys tell me that. Ah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, so what? You're telling me that is a sound collage? Weirdo artist. Ah, doesn't really impress me. Yeah, Sorry, okay. Mark. But thanks. Our, our... Thanks so much. Anyway, go ahead. Go on. <laughs> the, what the tubes in the we're, we're doing kind of weird shit before they went kind of mainstream in the Bay Area. Did you were you checking that stuff out? Like, were you were you kind of like going to a lot of shows or were you? Just yeah, well, kind of well, well, what were some of the first shows you saw that weren't like you know more like rock shows or whatever before before the punk thing hit? I remember. I I very I very clearly remember that. I went to see a show that was. Uh, it was the Cramps and Tuxedo Moon and uh, a, a duo called No Mercy, which was a, two women, one of them playing a polymogue and the other one doing this kind of screaming buto uh, performance thing. Um, and back then, it seemed like every show I went to, every band was completely different. There, it wasn't like a night of, it's all new wave bands or yeah. punk bands. It was just this incredible... Uh, a crazy mismatch of things. And that, of course, I loved. Um, you know, the Cramps asked me to be their drummer because I had red hair. I'm like, I'm starting my own band, get Miriam Lina. <laughs> and about Tuxedo Moon, one of my favorite records, I, it's so beautiful, I can't even listen to it, is by Stephen Brown and Blaine Reinigan called 400 Years of Music Live in Portugal. It's so painfully gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Piano and violin, I can't stand it. That's how much I love it. We had, it was the, yeah, they were drum machines, uh, you know, synthesizers, you had the violin, the bass, you know, it, it, it was a combination of things that was extremely exciting to me to hear. And it was actually made by someone who was lived not that far from me. So, and that, in fact, that's the, I think that's the first show I went to where I went out of the space it was happening in and just outside in the hallway, there was no backstage. So the band was just, the bands were just hanging out in the hallway and I didn't realize oh, they're just there. Like you can just talk to people and it's just all very human and accessible. And this was real exciting as well. Yeah, very, very exciting. So I also can remember seeing a very early Devo show where all of the, um, it was a dinner show and all of the tables were lined up coming away from the stage in a long, long row. So if you imagine a, a, a stage at a, a, a concert hall, and then rows and rows of tables coming away from the stage and everyone's sitting on them with their drinks and their dinner. And, the, and, and I kind of got found a place off to one side, looking kind of through the stage toward the audience. And I was, again, I was probably, I think 16. I have photo, I was taking photographs of the whole thing. And at some point, uh, Mark Mothersbaugh, the singer, you know, wearing knee pads, you know, just goes running out across all of the tables and <laughs> goes to his knees and slides across all of the tables and the dishes and the drinks, destroying everything. <laughs> nice. <laughs> And, and I have, of course, I had just never seen something like that happen <laughs> in my life. And there was this frozen moment of, I almost thought, well, is this, what is this? And the, and the whole audience who just had all their dinner and drinks destroyed on everyone, their laps everyone yet yes yeah <laughs> all right i have i have two inserts to that story first of all one of the strangest bills i was ever on teenage jesus b-52s are you shitting me mm -hmm. and the other is speaking about that dinner table setup i once saw the ramones at max's kansas city and it was the same nobody slid across the tables but i was sitting next to johnny ramones at the time girlfriend roxy who had her legs spread Stockings and garters, no panties, and a big hairy red bush. That's all I'm saying. 
<laughs> okay. Um. I just had to get an insert. Yeah, that was a, that was that was a good thing to insert. All the well, let's talk. Let's talk about your your, your connective tissue. I mean, so so or here it is where I'm going to go. I, I mean, so my connective tissue. I mean, I mean, well, the t connection between the two of you. So you have Brian Eno who produces No New York. Much to who, the detriment who, of Teenage Jesus, thank and you And who much. also produces You Too, who, who ends up suing you too. Oh, <laughs> let's, we really, you. we, we got to get into that because, I mean, it just goes to prove what cunts they are from the beginning to the end of their entire fucking career anyway. So, <laughs> I mean, how dare, how dare. Instead of suing you, they should have given you a fucking million dollars. That's, that's my opinion. Well, was it a cease and desist letter or did they actually try to like <laughs> sue you for fucking money? Oh, no, it was a real lawsuit. Okay. It was we sued for, or for uh, fraud, defamation of character. Oh, my God. Right, infringement, <laughs> uh, failure to, you know, we, we, we altered the lyrics to when we did this so, so, sort of cover version of one of their songs. So you have to get permission to do that. Uh, it was, yeah, they sued us for everything they could think of because it, it happened that the release of the record, and this is one of the things, there's a lot of things Negative Land does very intentionally, but this was not an intentional thing. The release of the YouTube single was delayed and delayed and delayed for reasons it just, just various reasons it got delayed coming out. When it finally came out, it happened to come out one month before the release of a new U2 <laughs> album, which meant it registered in the in, in the minds of the public and record stores like it was the advanced oh, single right. got to promote the album. So it was absolutely perfect that it got delayed because that's I think if it had come out nine months earlier, which is when it was supposed to, I really don't think it would have played out the same way it did. It, they were freaked it, out. You know what? You know yeah. what's so frustrating because I, I had uh, I know some musicians who had made some record years ago and BC boys ended up suing or ended up sampling them. And, and basically when they went to their lawyers, you know, their lawyers like, don't even try. You're going to be spending all this money. You're going against the wall. So it's like, if someone samples your obscure thing, how, how dare you even try approach them as opposed to, hang on, hang on Tim. But did you ever just try to make a personal plea to them? Like, Hey guys, yeah. you guys are on the, ra the radio and interview, right? And no, it's a lot. Yeah, there's a, I mean, it's too much to go into here, but we actually basically th through uh, our friends at Mondo 2000 magazine, we basically tricked the edge into being interviewed by us. He didn't realize oh, who we were. Nice. And so we did make a sort of a personal plea. I always thought what they should have done was just taken our record and put it as a remixed on a B side of a 12 inch single of theirs. You know, that would have been the creative response to the whole thing but, but they're not but they're not creative therefore they they filed a lawsuit well what was also so silly it was on the eve of their whole zoo tv tour where there's sampling yeah. and doing collages things that you guys have been doing yeah. for years and and, and then they were just that, appropriating that and then then the, how dare you yeah oh, god well that's what we ended up asking the edge in the inner when we interviewed him before he before we revealed who we were one of the things we brought up was well, you're doing this interesting new tour where you're actually appropriating things from, from media and, and television and all this stuff mixed in and collaging it into your concerts in front of, you know, 30,000 people in a stadium. You know, what, how do you feel about that both creatively and, and legally? <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's when he said, well, we feel like as long as you're altering it and using ah. it in a new way, that that's okay. And that's the right answer. That's the right answer we agree with. And so at that point we said, that's interesting. You say that the, but it, it, also, <laughs> it also, it turns out besides us working for this magazine, we also are in a group that called Negative Land that you and your, your team just sued the you know, hell out of. So, did, did they get anything up? Did, what did they get in the end? Well, the, besides a reputation as being bigger cunts than they already were. We were compelled. I mean, it was, it's, again, it's very complicated yeah. because we were on another record label at the time. So we couldn't just, we were trying to work things out in a way that worked for all parties, but we were compelled to send back the master tapes, the original artwork, all the records that were, and CDs and cassettes that were still left to be destroyed. 
We sent back copies of the master tapes, copies of, of the course. artwork, not the originals. Duh. And we later learned from a mole that we had inside <laughs> Island Records that when they got all the records that all the employees were taking them home because of course they wanted to hear what was causing all this fuss. Um, so, yeah, well, that's, uh, that's pretty lame. But yeah. in, a, in a way, that's publicity you can't even pay for although it's a big fucking hassle out of people that are so uncreative that then steal the basic concept of what you'd already been doing for years well we did end up being sued again for putting out a magazine that was about being sued for putting out the record because our own label sst records and greg ginn sued us and so it ended up <laughs> greg wait, 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 okay wait well yeah we can't we can't wait wait, yeah, wait, wait. <laughs> greg ginn I have to yeah, say, the founder of Black Flag. Black Flag. I also have to say nothing because it would only be incriminating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I like his guitar playing. <laughs> I don't know him as a person. Sure. They made some. I I like some early Black Flag records a lot too. I can separate it out. Of course, yeah, of course, but you know, course. again, you don't have to be a dick on this level. Uh, no, but as you probably know, there are certain kinds of personalities that tend to be drawn toward running record labels and wanting to have and the whole business of music and taking advantage of. Well, you know, I've been very lucky is that I've taken those, advantage yeah. of a lot of small labels and licensing my label over and over again. So actually, I want a lot of those uh, that concept. Here, here's a fun, here's yeah. a fun The Edge story. A friend of mine who was a gigging musician in Dublin was just, you know, just a, a jazz guy playing some background jazz event, some high society thing. And the edge was there as like some kind of I don't know, benefit donor. And someone whispers to his ear. He's like, uh, the edge is here and he wants to sit in and play the guitar. And, and my buddy's like, I don't let anyone play my guitar. And they all kind of like went silent, like, but it's the edge. Like, no, 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 no. I don't let anyone play my guitar. I don't care who the fuck. And, and it was like, he didn't let him, and and I think everyone was mad at this guy and stuff like this. Like, but this guy's like a, a jazz Look, virtuoso. The, uh, <laughs> the best thing Bono, like Bozo, ever did was support Gavin Friday for years of the Virgin Prunes, and help him to live while he did his two solo albums, which were great. Each man kills the thing, he, things he loved, and Shag Tobacco. Uh, Gavin Friday is a true original weirdo. I don't know why, with all their bloody millions, they're not also supporting the rest of us. How much money do you need? I don't know. Well, yes. I think it was calculated with the amount of profit that Jeff Bezos has made since the pandemic started. Oh, he could God. pay every one of his employees a bonus of $100,000. So why doesn't he just do, do it. that? Because well, it, it, it's, even, it's even worse because, because all the bailout it, money should be paid by these guys because guess what? If they do, it's going to go back to them anyways because everyone's ordering everything online. So and even guess even what? Does. It's not their fucking money. And you were, if we're talking about, you know, why uh, Moscow Mitch is not releasing the fucking purse strings, it's not his fucking money. So let everybody lose their fucking... It's, again, it's almost like the savings and loan scandal all over again. Only they're doing it instead of closing 50 banks under Ronald Reagan, they're going to close millions of people out of their own fucking houses. What I wanted to just say to respond to something Lydia said earlier was that it's, we, we didn't look at it as a, as a moment for, for publicity for right. us and our work. What we did see was it was a moment to further this conversation that had, we thought had to happen about this collision that's happening between art, creativity, techno new technologies, copyright laws, corporate interests. I mean, all of this was obviously in the early 90s, there was this, they were all colliding together and we weren't hearing anything being said in the public from any point of view that was art friendly, creator friendly, you know, culturally enlightened. It was just the producers, the, own, the owners, the managers, the money people, the lawyers. And so it felt like because we were being sued on behalf of the largest rock band on the planet earth, we'd actually been handed an opportunity that was amazing where we could actually talk about this in, in a way and get some attention drawn and, to and it. And which so, you have yeah. talked about it. I mean, it's yeah, been so, one of your main themes about, you know, the, the prevalence of technology for a lot of the wrong reasons while using it to try to expand an artistic universe. Was that before the uh, sampling laws about like, what was it, two measures or four measures that was allowed? Was that, was that, did that happen before that, that, uh, 
Well, no, that's a that's a commonly mis uh, uh, thought myth okay. that there is no amount that's okay to sample. If you want, I want to sue you because you sampled one drum hit off my record. I can. I mean, our legal system has been set up in a terrible way by you know. It, it, it was set up by you know white land and slave owning guys to maintain their power. It was never set up to be uh, a, a, a fair uh, playing field for people. And we sort of learned that in a really direct way once we got okay. sued the, okay. the second time because Greg Ginn was really abusing it because he just wanted to, he just was mad at us and just wanted to make our lives. If I was bad. Greg Ginn, I'd be mad at myself. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, that's good. But to talk, go back to the, the uh, what you were asking about with the, the record we've just put yeah. out is that, is that, in fact, I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah, we actually have in various ways, we're, we're once again dealing with the impacts of technology on, on, on us and, and kind of channeling our, our thoughts and ideas about that into new work. And so it, it's a sequel to this record we made a year ago called True False. And that record felt to, to me like a kind of a negative land overview of every of what what's going on right, we, what we feel like about what's going on right now. And then the sequel was this kind of deep dive into all of our hopes and fears and the weirdness of all the, the technological universe we now find ourselves you know buried alive in and how it's affecting us. And it just seemed like really fertile, interesting territory for us to kind of do what it is that we do. And it also turned out that after we had various members of the group had died, that we were digging into our old archives of all these bits and pieces of sounds and voices that had never been used on our records, but had showed up on our radio shows and live performances. And they were beautiful, incredible samples. And it turned out that a lot of them were shocking, spookily relevant to what we were dealing with now, as opposed to the sample might be from 1984, from something we had in our archives that had never been used. And so the members of the group who died are very much alive and present, at least in my view, yeah. on our record because of how we collaged. I was going to ask about that. Th that's and, really, that's yeah. fantastic. Because, yeah, Go because a, a, lot, a lot of the members, and, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that was like uh, the Rolling Stones tattooed you was just going into vaults. And that, that, that album was recorded from set, basically 68 to 1980. And, you know, if you have that history, you actually have that, uh, those archives to access. Does that, you know, I don't know what your personal relationship with the, with the dead members of Negative Land, what, what, that, what that was like. I have all of, I have all of their ashes on my oh, front cool, porch, cool. so I no, do but, have but, a very personal relationship with them right is, now. Is that, is that a, uh, how does that, I mean, I don't want to sound like Oprah here, but how does that feel uh, making art with the dead? I have ashes of one of my great collaborators as well. Oh. So I understand. And sometimes, you know, where would they rather be? In a field yeah. or next to my mini Fender Squire guitar? I don't know. Yeah. Well, Richard's ashes are inside of a little co a little a cookie jar that looks like a log and it says cookie log on it and there's a squirrel on the top oh. of it. And Squirrel? And, uh, squirrel? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I, lo I love squirrels, by the way. So pet the squirrel for me. <laughs> well, yeah, will do. Yeah, and then Don's Ashes, we ended up distributing them along with a release we put out a few years back where everyone got a, like two grams of his ashes in a bag that came with every copy of the, of the CD. And it was a CD that was our take on, the sh on shopping networks. It was called the Chopping <laughs> Channel. And it was kind of this idea that we're gonna commodify and sell everything, including your own body and bodily fluids. And it was finished before Don died, but after he died, we thought it's too perfect. We have his ashes. We know he would want us to do you this. You know, you're, like, you're really inspiring a concept in me because I always thought when I die, stuff me, put a voice box, put me on tour. But no, you just gave me another idea. <laughs> okay, Gunter von Hagen's Body Worlds, which I'm just fetish. Body works, body works. Body, body works, which I just fetishize about. I can almost see myself being cut into a million tiny plastic, plastic slices, which, yes, all, plastic. which all have one sentence of spoken word. Oh, I, I, I'll I'll stop there. So so Lydia lunch carpaccio I, is basically what you're nice. Talking. I'm sure it would taste delicious <laughs> and sound awful. <laughs> I think you should you should definitely pursue that. Well, there's it's a, terrible potential. that I, I mean I wish I could say I'm only going to die once, but that's not fucking true. We've all died about a thousand times already. So uh, yeah. I think I'll just keep it the way it is right now. Thank you very much. 
My friend says, you wish you could die. You can't. It keeps on going. What if death is not the end? <laughs> well, I do think that if you could, if, if you were imagining that some, somehow there was some uh, random choice about where you would end up being dropped to live your life throughout all of human history, if, if it turns out that you're here in this particular moment and as we are kind of watching the whole system collapse. We are watching America is it's doing all the things civilizations do as they go down. It's following it to a T. But I, I may, I may regret saying this someday. But at least I, I find all of it at some level to be really, really interesting. It's a really interesting time to be alive. As, it's horrifying, <laughs> but it's really as an apocalyptician. I love yes. these times because it's everything I've already been fucking saying my entire life. And the basic line, but the bottom line, it's what you just said. It's the same as it ever fucking was. This is just cyclical bullshit, which history repeats over and over again, as you said, to a fucking T-R-U-M-P. Well, I was just also thinking about, and it's something that I, I happened to, um, I watched an interview that Lydia did with Anthony Bourdain just before doing this, which is which was really making was making me laugh. It's very funny. Um, but you said something to the effect of, you know, you're 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 drawn to doing this creative stuff. It's not because you think it's going to make you happy. It's there's something interesting that draws you, and there's something about feeling like you you succeeded in doing it that uh, there's a satisfaction there that has great meaning, and somehow that's the thing. And sometimes when you're doing it, you can feel happy. I, I, you know, like when I'm on stage, I occasionally have fun, but mostly <laughs> I always think I'm not up here to have fun. I'm up here to do a really, really great job for the people who are here in the room who are giving their time and money and energy to me and my friends to see what we're doing. And so I've done shows where I kind of was have fun and I listen back to them and I think they were shitty. We d I didn't do a good job. And that, so I'm, I'm not here to have fun. If I have fun doing it, it, it's like a bonus and I appreciate it. When I'm on stage, I'm always having fun. It doesn't mean the audience always is. So it's kind of a, kind of the, the opposite side opposite. Of, that, sure. of that coin. Yeah. But I mean, yes. I feel that, you know, both of us and many of the people we have on this show, there is no choice. We do what we do because we have to do it. Otherwise we would be sicker than what we already are. We would have more physical or, or emotional pain. Something burns in our blood. We have to commit it to vinyl, to film, to photography, to a painting, to whatever format that we have to exercise it because there is something inside us that has to fucking come out. And that's why I thank you for your very existence Mark of Negative Land. I don't know what else to say. Well, well, well. So, Mark, here's my fantasy about about you're talking about like you're watching. What's your fantasy? Well, this is this is my deepest, most primal fantasy that drives I me. I doubt day. it. I doubt it. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you're talking about you're witnessing the whole collapse and and um and and watching uh, civilization unravel. I'm hoping if I if I could even be a sicker voyeur of all of this that we turn everything around. We, we, we basically save the world, global warming, we do everything right, everything comes together, and then that's when the meteor comes and just basically, <laughs> after we just save it, everything's done. Uh, <laughs> oh, gee. You know what, just again, if we say that history repeats itself, which it does, when were the glory days, especially in this fucking country? There were no fucking glory days. This land is based on murder, homicide, prejudice, war, bullshit. When were the glory days? Are they here to come yet? I know we're only a little bit over 200 years old, but you know what? I can't hold my breath any fucking longer. This is the Lydian well, spin with Lydia Launch, Tim Dahl, Mark of <laughs> Negative Land. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Thank you.